thanks everybody for uh, the first one in, in Samaritan Switzerland. Uh, so thanks everybody for uh, listening to this. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Web3 and US securities laws. So first, why do we're in Switzerland? Why, why does anybody even care about US securities law? That's the first question, right? I mean, uh, the, the reason why anybody who's not even American cares or probably cares is just because the outsized influence the US has. So I'm not going to get into politics, whether the US should have this outsized influence or not. But the reality is it does, simply because the size of the economy and the liquidity of the market. It's a, the, right now still the world's largest economy at $20 trillion. And it has the most investors and most investment. And that's really why I think for most people, that's the main reason why people care. Now, there you can argue there are parallel uh, economies being created, whether it's the Chinese ecosystem or the European ecosystem. And I think there's a divergence between, frankly, the US and, and the Chinese ecosystem. Uh, and that's very real right now. The, the two are, are, are really decoupling in some way. But I think everyone in the US, uh, the Western ecosystem is still tied into the US ecosystem simply because, as I mentioned, the liquidity and the large size of the US market. The other thing is the US, uh, which again, you not know, getting into the politics, it does uh, exercise some extraterritorial jurisdiction. Very unusual for uh, a country. And maybe, frankly, it's, it's a superpower and therefore uh, they can do it. Um, not good, not bad, but I'm just explaining what happens. And in Switzerland, uh, I think all of the people have seen that with the banking system. Very heavily, the U.S. has put a long arm into the into the Swiss ecosystem as well. The banking regulations, FATCA, all of this thing is very real for, for everybody here in Switzerland as well, because this is a banking and finance uh, driven economy in Switzerland. But the specific thing that where it relates to Web3 and, and not getting into intellectual property or other issues that we talked about in, in, in NFTs, but regarding raising capital, that's the basis for any company. People here mentioned they've raised capital. I think this gentleman mentioned he raised capital. Uh, there's several other people who've raised capital and everybody, he's an, uh, this gentleman's an investor. And so it, it's a very relevant to a part of, of a company. And the primary element of raising capital is, is issuing a security. So that is, 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 is what the heart of U.S. securities law is about. And it differs from any other country, really. Um, I can speak about the U.K. And, and India, where I'm also licensed to practice. But in those countries, private companies are not really impacted by the securities laws in the same way. Usually, when I talk to other lawyers or other investors or companies, they're always confused. Why is the government or the, why are there so many regulations around private companies? I get it if it's a public company, if it's a listed company. There should be all kinds of regulations. Why is it a private company that has so many regulations? And that's the heart of, of U.S. securities laws. Certainly, public companies have their own regulations. But the U.S. is unique because private companies are also heavily regulated in securities. And if you go back in history, you, you know, the reason ostensibly is the 1929 stock market crash. There are lots of frauds, uh, fraudulent transactions playing taking place. And the, and the SEC, the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission, was formed. There are two significant acts, the 33 Act. The 34 Act. The 33 Act is around the issuance of securities. The 34 Act is around regular reporting. It's more for public companies. But the idea primarily is to regulate securities. And basically, the, the basic tenet is either you need to uh, register with the SEC and disclose what your security is, or you find an exemption from, from the registration. That's the fundamental uh, starting point. So what does registration mean? You need to basically make a lot of disclosure. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. It's basically like filing a prospectus. So generally, private companies don't want to register with the SEC. They want to find an exemption for the S from the SEC registration. And the good thing is there are plenty of exemptions. The number one exemption that people use is under reg Regulation D or uh, Rule 506, which is around uh, issuance of securities to accredited investors. You've probably all heard the word accredited investors. Generally, it's somebody who makes above two to three hundred thousand dollars a year and had a, has a net uh, assets, uh, not including their main house, of over a million dollars a year. So, generally, the investment community that we're talking about generally would be accredited investors. Where people get into problems a lot of times is when they're dealing with retail investors because they're not accredited and it's difficult or impossible to find an exemption for those. And particularly when you see coin offerings. So, I'll get into you know the coin offerings and the security. And what what the issues? I, I'll give a real live example um, of a case that that probably many uh, of you are familiar with. So, uh, Ripple was sued by the SEC last year. In fact, the two uh, the two founders, Brad Garlinghouse, and I think I don't remember the other gentleman's name. Maybe I'm sure one of you know. Um, 
in any case, were sued by the SEC. Why they were sued by the SEC was because the allegation was that Ripple XRP is a security. Now, Ripple's defense is it's not a security, it's, it's a currency. So that, that's what the SEC so far has held on Bitcoin, and it's probably Ethereum as well, that these are not securities, they're uh, currencies, which are essentially commodities, and therefore not securities. So what makes something a security? It, it's a security if it's basically for the purposes of an investment. There's a purpose and you expect to make profit from it. You don't necessarily expect to do that with a currency, ostensibly. It's for a use case or it's a store of value. It's not necessarily to make a profit from it. And that's the distinction between a security and not a security. And so with Ripple, that case is still going on. And we can analyze that uh, as to what's happened. But I will talk about a case that's uh, already somewhat been decided, which is Telegram. I, I, we all use Telegram. This group was formed on Telegram. So it's a very live case. In Telegram, uh, as you know, there was there was there's Telegram, which is the the messaging system. Uh, Pavel, I think Gaurav was the founder, uh, and they use that. That's the messaging system. But there's also a token, which is basically called Grams, which was around um, the, the the usage of this. I don't know if anybody has bought the token is familiar with the token, but there's essentially a token around Telegram called Grams. It raised 1.7 billion dollars from investors, including U.S. investors, including some of the top uh, leading Silicon Valley venture funds. And that case was very uh, interesting because in that case, Telegram uh, was sued by the SEC and the outcome was that Telegram actually agreed to refund all the money back to the US investors. It was kind of unprecedented. If you're a Silicon Valley investor, uh, one of the top venture funds, you get money back and you actually get a refund back from the company. Uh, and that was sort of unprecedented in, in my view. And so what happened in that case was the SEC filed suit against Telegram. And Telegram, again, gave the same um, same argument that it's not a security. Now, the SEC in that case took the view that not only was it a security, but the security actually involved US purchasers. And, and I'll explain more about that. So I mentioned how you could have accredited investors. And so in the Telegram case, what happened was these venture capital funds put into their accredited investors. And so they did file the relevant paperwork called the Form D for accredited investors. However, the SEC took the view that those venture capital investors, those accredited investors, would in fact invest in, in the Telegram token and then resell those securities to non-accredited investors. So basically, the idea was that you're going to profit off a secondary transaction, which would likely be U.S. investors. So it's really sort of an example of, well, we already filed the right all the right paperwork. What else do you want? I think they, the SEC went beyond that and said, you, you, you will target... Uh, including non-accredited uh, non investors. And I think there were several things that I think Telegram, when you, when you go through the case, you'll find very interesting examples of how Telegram tried to argue and tried to settle with the SEC, saying, in fact, that we will wall off, wall off our U.S. investors. We will, uh, we, we will basically have a separate wallet. If anyone is typing in from a, a U.S. Uh, IP address, we won't allow them. But the SEC didn't buy that. Uh, and it, it essentially... Uh, that the refund was basically given. The, the other interesting thing that was really interesting in that case was a case that actually probably isn't talked about too much called the Morrison case, which was a 2010 U.S. Supreme Court case regarding uh, transactions and whether a, a U, it was a U.S. transaction or a domestic transaction. And in that the Ripple, sorry, the Telegram case, the court actually cited the Morrison case and went back to that case. In the Morrison case, it, the, uh, it was talked about how any case involving a U.S. domestic transaction uh, trans really affected the U.S. domestic transactions. However, in this new case, the Telegram case, the SEC and the judge basically was a U.S. federal judge in New York, looked back at that case and said Morrison actually, the way it applied was to a transaction. And basically the transaction, because there was a secondary transaction, even if it wasn't an exchange, that that transaction would be with U.S. purchasers. And therefore... Uh, it was going to involve U.S. transactions. So the point I'm making here is that when you are uh, looking at, at, at raising capital, it's very murky and you have to be very careful about dealing with U.S. investors and, and understand what the regulations uh, are and rules are uh, regarding dealing with that. And a lot of people, I think, choose not to deal with U.S. investors, and that's certainly an option. Uh, but for those people who are either U.S. citizens or U.S. venture funds or you are... Uh, somehow interested in attracting those funds, and it's, it's a very real issue to deal with. 
The other thing I really wanted to, to talk about very quickly was on DAOs, because I, I was impressed by some people to talk about DAOs. So DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, is, uh, is, a, is what is uh, a DAO. And so these are a fairly new, maybe in the last three, four, five years, form of, of business. Now, uh, this, these informal associations, of course, been around for thousands of years. But the way it's now being applied to blockchain and crypto technologies is certainly very new. And it's sort of a gray area as to how these things get organized, who the legal, where, what's the jurisdiction, what's the liability, what's the tax uh, issues. And so there are multiple ways to organize DAOs. Sort of in my own experience, you know, one typical way just dealing from the U.S. is you set up a U.S. LLC. That's probably the most simple and straightforward way to do it. Uh, the only challenge is, of course, if you're not a U.S. person, then you subject yourself to U.S. laws and potentially U.S. taxation, which is fine if you're an American or willing to deal with the U.S. system. If you're not, then certainly there are people who are not interested in that. There are several states. Wyoming, in fact, is probably the forefront of this, has passed laws, regulations around DAOs. Uh, I still haven't seen that many people use Wyoming for whatever reason, maybe because still the preferred states of Delaware and Nevada, which are still the, kind of the more leading, more established space, at least for LLCs. But we'll see whether Wyoming uh, it becomes more useful. The other way is that people set up foundations. Uh, if you don't set up an LLC, you can have a foundation. We don't really have that same concept in the US, so I've typically seen it in Switzerland or in, uh, in Cayman Islands. These are places where foundations are, are much more established in Malta, Gibraltar, maybe they're more well known. So you have a foundation. The foundation is ostensibly a nonprofit because you're issuing perhaps tokens or some kind of governance token around that. But then you have to have another entity which really can raise capital, employ people, all of that. And so you have basically have a, a series of agreements between the, the two, a foundation and then an actual company which owns the technology, hires the people, all of that raises the capital. But there, there, there's still a lot of gray area in between um, DAOs, but I think they're definitely going to be something to, uh, to take, to take uh, forward. But even in a DAO, that whole issue is what I just spoke about, which is around securities and tokens, all of that still has uh, an impact on U.S. securities transactions. And so all of that is still going to be something that needs to be, uh, be considered because uh, you know, the, the, the long arm of the law is, is the U.S., the, the jur they've already proved, proven in Telegram that the SEC is willing to go extra, what, what uh, some would call extra uh, territorial and jurisdiction. They, they have no problems with, with going beyond uh, and, and, and reaching uh, far across the globe uh, in enforcing their, their jurisdiction. It's a very unique uh, aspect. And so, you know, the Telegram case was a very seminal case. $1.7 million is a, is a large amount of money. And that was the case that's going on. Ripple, I think, is probably the, in the top 10 of traded, tra traded currencies or traded um, question whether it is a currency, again, from the SEC. But uh, clearly, there's a big impact in this. And I think the, it's going to remain to be seen because uh, I think the detractors of this feel that you know, the U U.S. should have a leading position in crypto blockchain and, and whether these regulations are actually going to drive people outside the U.S. There's an argument for that, too. The other argument is that uh, whatever the, the regulations are, people are just going to have to deal with it just because, as I mentioned, the size uh, and liquidity of the U.S. market is such that uh, it's so important that um, there are regulations or there's still gray areas in regulations, but people are just going to have to live with it and, and figure out how to solve it. So those are those are some of my thoughts. I, I don't know if there are any questions that people had. I'm happy to answer a few questions. Again, this is not legal advice. It's all... Hello. Yeah, I'm the late cover. <laughs> Sorry. My name is Coast. Sorry to disrupt everyone, but that was really wonderful. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, and you can feel the passion coming out of what you're talking about. Uh, Thank you. If you don't mind, is there a quick question about yeah. this DAO? Uh, is it like a, a legal structure, this uh, DAO, or is it something? Well, that's, that's, the, that's the question, right? So uh, many people argue that the whole point is it shouldn't be an organization. And so I think we're left with having to set up something, whether it's an LLC, whether it's a foundation. So um, I, I'd be curious if we can talk more about how. Do you? Or you need solves that, you? for example. Right? Yeah. Do you have to have an, uh, an, LLC, uh, an LLC or any sort of legal structure? I mean, Ethereum, um, the first the DAO, the original DAO, obviously, we didn't have any registered company. That's true. There's loads of DAOs. Uniswap is another example, has what you could argue are employees, but they're really just people that are paid in uni token. Um, they buy their own computers. They're not employed by anybody. They pay taxes as freelancers in you know, their own jurisdiction. 
So do you really need uh, an, uh, like a, a fully regulated, a fully registered company to that? Well, I think the, the, the idea is if you want to raise money, if the company wants to raise money, in a traditional equity offering, you have to have it. Oh, cool. Of right? course, if, if you don't, which DAO raises equity? You'd be stupid to have a DAO and raise equity. <laughs> Just sell your own token. That's possible. Um, but again, I think the problem is that who's in charge of it, who's selling it, who bears the tax, the liabilities. It's okay if everybody buys their own computer, but I think it's still uh, a gray area. I think many of these, like Ethereum, became a foundation eventually. Well, yeah, because the DAO massively failed, but, but that's a different, <laughs> that's a different story. Yeah. Okay. But maybe yeah. also just to add, just so of course um, everybody else knows what we're talking about. So there's DAOs that don't have a legal structure, and then there's DAOs in the U.S., that like there's three states that you mentioned, um, Delaware, Wyoming, and what was the other one? Where you can have an LLC, like a DAO registered as an LLC, so it does have a legal entity, so you can transact with it in a traditional way. So it's kind of new. I but think that's that was introduced last often. year. Yeah, Wyoming was introduced last year. The other states don't technically have a structure for DAOs, but they're very popular and people use them. Yeah. Uh, I know that's because I'm based in, the, I have my headquarters based in Singapore, and I'm looking up ICO for my own company. So I've been talking a few weeks ago with my lawyer, and he was telling me that in Singapore, when you do a security token, you have to raise capital or whatsoever, you need a foundation. That's a way for them that they can regular, uh, you know, regulate the markets. And uh, so I'm really into this, uh, <laughs> this talk right now. And uh, but interesting to know that uh, what, what uh, I was trying to figure out because foundation I know is non-profit organization. Uh, I have a PTLTD in Singapore which owns the patent and all the IP of my company, and I'm still trying to figure out how I can use this this foundation uh, in order to raise ICO. And at the end, the one that's going to benefit this one will be the company generating IP, which is non-profit is a is a profit organization. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's the link between these two entities and how to make it more uh, legal or... Yeah, know, no, that's right. I mentioned that, how, how you have a foundation and then you have an actual yeah, company, exactly. right? That, uh, that's the typical structure, right? What's link between both of them? It's like, because the money will come from the foundation, but at the end, the IP will belong to the private limited. So right, but the point is the foundation can pay for services, right? So basically push money down because yeah. it needs employees, it needs IP, it needs to buy IP, needs to hire employees, yeah. needs to rent a space. And so that's kind of the way you can push some money down okay. as long as you keep money uh, in the foundation in the to do foundation. what it needs to do. Yeah. Uh, that's the way I've traditionally seen it. Okay. Is that, that sort of structure. Yeah. You earlier said something about the jurisdiction of the US reaching out into land that actually is outside the US. Extraterritorial, yeah. yeah Extraterritorial. It is one thing that the US reaches out but what do the nations say in terms of sovereignty? Like, why would that happen? Why does everybody stay small and not say, "Hey, stop it! This is this is our country." Is well, I don't. I don't think they're they're going after governments, right? They're going after companies, right? So the, it's not that the government is. No, no is that's obvious. But if you are registered in, 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 in a country that is outside the U.S., then why would the SEC think that they have an impact? Or well, the, the, the argument... Take well, U.S. investors. You yeah. take on U.S. dollars. Yeah. Yeah. As, as soon as you touch U.S. dollars, you're fucked, basically. <laughs> that's, <laughs> what, <laughs> that's a way to track the yeah. taxation yeah. system. So so it's just about the currency yeah. itself. Yeah. And from, the from there, the they double the case yeah. against... Yeah. It's not only the currency, yeah. I think. It's, it's the, for the, the tax people. system. It's the bonus of the individual investor that is investing into the Yeah. It's unless you can and remember I, I mentioned in Telegram that Telegram the company actually offered that we will wall off all US investors, yeah. right? We won't let them participate, right? Yeah. IP address, different wallets, all of that. Yeah. But the SEC rejected that and said there's no guarantee on that. Uh, and the, the, the other point really which was very interesting was that you even those non US people might sell to US people. Right? So I, you're not a U.S. person. I give you the, the token. Well, you might just say, well, I'm going to go sell it to a U.S. person. How does the company uh, address that? They can't really stop it. And so that was uh, why. So I don't opine whether it was really fair or not, but I think we've seen in the Swiss case that uh, the Justice Department was, was very heavy-handed and, and this, the, the banks here complied, essentially, with FATCA. Because essentially what the U.S. has, the stick that they can wield over, I think most countries is you don't, don't use the U.S. banking system then. And I think to, to our, our friend yeah. here, who okay. basically commented about the dollar that if you're outside the U.S. bank, you don't have a SWIFT code, uh, you don't have a, access to U.S. banking system, it's very difficult then. Yeah, okay, but that kind of bans brand or whatsoever, sell it to U.S. market. Let's say if Telegram say, no, we don't give a shit about what you say, 
and try to promote does uh, this uh, US can say okay we find you you cannot sell telegram to the app stores or whatever because they can do this yeah that's right that's what that's essentially what happened is okay, you cannot yeah. sell so to US investors market, that, it's okay. just closed off right and, and then uh, roll, yeah they can ban you on the entire market okay. and and as I mentioned uh, you know the fundamental reason like why does anybody care uh, is just because the size and scale of the US